Hello, everybody, and welcome to What the Hell Should I Watch? I'm Steve Stebbing. I'm Chloe Stebbing. And we are your weekly rundown of what we're watching, so it may become what you're watching over the next week and weekend. So, first, welcome back, Chloe. Yep, I'm back. It was, <laughs> it was a one-person Just... tandem last week. Yeah, yeah. You you, you did fine, though. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I think it's because I'm doing <laughs> trivia and, and Q&As now and stuff like that, so I'm more fearless, I guess. Or I can yeah. vamp more. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's a talent. We'll see. Um, but, I mean, I'm so happy you're back on the show. And with new things, we do segments now. Great. Fresh for your eyeballs this week. I know. I'm surprising everybody this week. Uh, I teased last week that, uh, that I was going to be bringing ryan gosling and the fall guy uh this also stars emily blunt um well why am i doing it all myself i can hand it right <laughs> back to my person that does this one chloe what's this one about a down and out stuntman must find the missing star of his ex-girlfriend's blockbuster film starring ryan gosling emily blunt aaron taylor jo johnson hannah wedding w waddingham. waddingham waddingham there we go and Winston Duke, directed by David Leitch. Yes, and Hannah Waddingham was in Ted Lasso. She's the owner of the soccer team in Ted Lasso, which I highly recommend. It's a really, really good, uh, sweet-hearted show, and you don't even have to like uh, European football to be into it. Um, <clears throat> but The Fall Guy is fun. It's just pure fun, and whatever you're seeing in the trailer comes across in the movie as well. Ryan Gosling has a really great comedic core, and I think he always has had that ability. Did you hear that buzz? Yeah, that was my dryer. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Ryan Gosling and comedy always works. Uh, it's usually, sadly, besides Barbie, it's really not successful when he goes to the comedy pool because... I mean, we're recording this on the Monday after Fall Guy has opened and it did under $30 million when they're projecting it would do between 30 and $40 million. So it is an expensive looking movie. There's a lot of stunts. There's a lot of explosions. There's a lot going on in this movie. So it did underperform. So like The Nice Guys, another really great and funny movie, which also underperformed, like it kind of looks like ryan gosling is great in comedy but it's not successful which i always hate talking about movies in success terms because i feel like yeah. it derives away from the art of the film yeah and what you're supposed to take in what's supposed yeah. what's supposed to matter so but it's a, it's a funny movie Gosling and Blunt have really, really great chemistry. Uh, I really love Hannah Waddingham in this. And David Leitch makes entertaining films. He did, you know, of course, the John Wick movies. He did Deadpool 2. He did Hobbs and Shaw. Like, he just makes fun movies. Uh, Atomic Blonde, which is a movie I really, really liked. Um, the guy makes solid movies. And if you're into action movies, his movies, I think, are kind of like of the top echelon of that genre right now. So. Um, before I move into the next one, I'm going to, a little news, um, that I don't have written down here, but I knew you'd be interested in this one. They moved up the date for Terrifier. Now, October oh, 11th, October 11th. Now it's coming out. Your sister's okay. birthday. <laughs> yeah. The day that m maniacal clowns come out again to have 30 minute <laughs> kill scenes. And they said they're going to yeah. go bigger and badder in this movie. I don't know what you've heard from day. I did. Is it Damien Leone is the writer director of this? Um, but he's, I mean, he got a lot of success off of that second film. So obviously the bar has been raised even more. So I can't even imagine yeah. what, what uh, you're in store for this one. I do hope that by like bigger, they mean like plot. <laughs> Yeah, actual plot because like yeah, two had plot, but it was a bad plot, and, <laughs> and it's like yeah, I'm I'm there for like the 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 gore and you know all that, 
but it still needs framework you know you can't just shove it out on the table exactly and tell me to eat it yeah it's like, that's kind <laughs> of what it's like though right it's just like rolling yeah. a bunch of stuff and i'm like do you like any of this i don't no. know i i mean I am yes on the, but... yeah, well, yeah yeah but i am on the i'm like i'm on the anti side of this because this is just a series that doesn't appeal to me at all so yeah I'm living through you on this one. And when it comes out, I'll probably again for review living through you on it. <laughs> let's just be honest about that one. All right. Let's uh, let's go to a Canadian film. Uh, this is Before I Change My Mind. 1987. While the other students wonder if the, if new kid Robin is a boy or girl, Robin forges a complicated bond with the school bully, making increasingly dangerous choices to fit in. Starring Vaughn Murray. Matthew Rankin, Dominic Lippa, Lacey Oak, and Shannon Blanchett, written and directed by Trevor Anderson. This is an interesting film because they never do reveal Robin's gender. So you, oh. I mean, there are connections that Robin forms with the bully and then the popular girl in the school and everything that all the boys are interested in. And you know... Yeah, like I feel that the romantic connection, the romantic, the longing look was towards the bully, but that could be a it could be a male or a female story. Like it, we don't know, uh, and it comes from the fact that Vaughn Murray her, uh, themselves is a non-binary actor. Um, though, if you look them up on IMDb, it looks like they're wearing uh, female gendered clothes in that picture. But again, it it's not pertaining to gender in any shape or form because a boy you know a male gender could wear those clothes as well like we don't know so this is a really interesting and mysterious way to approach this i love that it's set in the 80s so the score is really poppy and really kind of cheesy synthy and i I had a lot of Mm -hmm. fun with that and the script is actually kind of interesting in that coming of age sort of way um but matthew rankin uh, who plays Robin's dad in this movie um, is one of those um, the square shoulders, like tweed jacket, glasses, smoking dads, like nerdy smoking okay. dads. And his character and in, in storyline is kind of interesting be- because because he's kind of this quiet, nerdy guy. The The moms of the school are interested in him. So I thought okay. that was like his storyline is kind of funny because he's not really doesn't really know how to deal with that attention um Mm -hmm. but as far as like quirky films go i really dug it and it's crazy how much canadian film that i've been taking in in the last like two three weeks and for none of it to be like really subpar like i've seen some pretty solid canadian films over the last couple of weeks and uh i mean this one joins the ranks and there's like this weird like old historical um Ed, uh, about the city of Edmonton like video that plays in this movie like that Robin's watching at one point in it. I'm like that's super random and super <laughs> Canadian but at the end of the day I thought it was a solid movie I think I'm going to refrain from giving letterbox scores anymore because then it means that you have to go look at my letterbox and see what I scored this and give me a follow at the same time subterfuge <laughs> <laughs> It's very manipulative. I could tell in your look, you're like milking really? them for all they got. Yeah, absolutely. I'm getting. I'm just getting the follows. Uh, let's move on to something you said last night. A writer in her twenties accompanies her parents and younger sister on vacation, starring Carmen Madonia, Ramona Milano, and Paige Evans. Written and directed by Luis De, De-, De- Philippus. And uh, here we go with another um, LGBTQ plus film. Uh, This one about uh, a definite trans writer in her early 20s uh, going on a trip with with uh, a family that they they just seem like a very quiet and withdrawn type of family. And this is kind of one of those somber vacation films. Um, Really character driven with Carmen Bedonia's uh, character, Ren, uh, Renata. Um, and the ways in which the, the, the different relationships that the mother has with either of her daughters and the doting that she puts on Ren is, is really interesting. There's not really a lot of drive to this one. It's kind of like, what's that term from the two, the mumblecore type of 
quiet indie dramas that kind of okay. permeated the like the late 2000s early uh, 2010s um not quite to something like uh mark duplis and jay duplis were making but like kind of in that area but it is an interesting uh first feature from uh louis de uh, philippus um and i i mean it looks like a, a cheap and easy drama to make especially as a first feature you see definitely see a lot more people with with uh trying trying to be a way more ambitious and crazy with their money and it doesn't really work out but um he decided to take it um simple for this film and i, I think it works out it might come off as a bit bland and shallow to more mainstream viewers but i i thought um it, it was a it was it was a nice little indie drama wrapped up in an hour 40 so kind of solid stuff all righty so let's move on to the second segment All right, I only got one thing on the Blu-ray this week, and it's something I already brought uh, that I, I got in the mail, and it and I just wanted to give a little bit more exposure to it, and you're like, what? What are we going to talk about more? Uh, and it was a Western that I brought on, on Blu-ray called uh, Appaloosa that I hadn't seen in years. I have the DVD, but now I got the Blu-ray, so I decided to give it a watch, and um, I mean... I said on the on when I first talked about it, that that's a, a pretty authentic western and it really is like it's super authentic it's not grandiose like there's not sweeping shots of the vista or anything it's very simple and kind of guided just to these characters and Ed Harris is really good in it and uh and and Viggo Mortensen's really good in it I didn't even like you to describe what the movie was did I No Two friends hired to police a small town that is suffering under the rule of a rancher find their job complicated by the arrival of a young widow. Starring Ed Harris, Viggo Mortensen, Renee Zellweger, and Jeremy Irons. Written and directed by Ed Harris. This one is not like big and bombastic. Even the Mm -hmm. gunfights are really quick. um, and, And there's not much flash to them. But this is more about character. Um, and I have to really, really give it to, to Viggo Mortensen because that guy drips with character uh, in everything yeah. he does. Like he always is phenomenal in films. And um, I, I this would have been roughly around the history of violence. No, not history of violence. Um, Eastern Promises time, I believe, because I uh, he was uh, committed to doing this movie, but was like really busy during a, doing a lot of work. Um, and then the film was delayed and he tried to like, get out of it and like beg, like just get somebody else i can't really do it and um ed harris interviewed 25 different actors to like do the role and it was just like it came back to like vigo was the only dude that could do this movie and uh he agreed finally like and within two days he was there in character like deep deep like had like deep thoughts about the character and everything ready to go and he nailed an incredible performance uh, like he always does. Uh, and Jeremy Irons is also really, really great in this movie. Um, and it's just a solid movie that I really think people forgot about. So, yeah, Appaloosa, really great film. I don't even know if it's streaming anywhere. Maybe if it if it's not or if it is, we can pop it there. And there we go. Let's move to the next segment. <laughs> Uh, and I had to call that one the streaming pile because I think I'm hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I also have my judge on the other side that says I'm not. So <laughs> All right. So let's start out with our first title on the streaming pile. Let it be. The filmed account of the Beatles' attempt to recapture their old group spirit by making a Back to Basics album, which instead drove them further apart. Starring John, Paul, George, and Ringo, directed by Michael Lindsay Hogg, and it's available on Disney+. And see, I took in, I want to say it was last year that Get Back came out, which was Peter Jackson taking all that footage from them doing Let It Be, and uh, which was also them trying to make this this big concert film and they took all of that footage uh, Peter Jackson did and remastered it, rebrought all the sound and everything. And it was like a six hour 
like docu series and it was incredible it's like being a fly on the wall for one of the most important album recordings ever because while it was the beatles breaking up like the biggest i i'm gonna say the, they are the the biggest most important band ever i fucking love this band they are the best band ever period because they mm-hmm. informed so much to come i mean you know how yeah. important the beatles are like to me personally and to, to to the family personally right yeah um but it's not it's not hyperbole like they really are they set a template for everything and this time in their lives is really interesting because the fame and and how big everything got and how fast everything went clearly got to all of these guys and paul's just trying to hold it together john is on a new journey like he's on this kind of spiritual journey as well as like a political like a newly fleshed political and anti-government sort of journey uh george is definitely on a spiritual journey because he's you know with the Hare krishnas and everything and he's going to india and hanging out with the dalai lama and all like this is stuff that's really important to him and ringo's just kind of go with the flow as he always was but you can tell that it wasn't working anymore so to to see that in a stretched out form gives you a very different narrative to what let it be did because let it be was originally released in 1970 doesn't have the distance of of having all of what the Beatles ended up influencing and everything. Because if you're watching this movie in 1970, I don't think it has any resonance because it's also recent. It's yeah. it's but now watching that rooftop concert in 2024 and knowing how much that means and how nothing like it was done again just the biggest band in the world just all of a sudden kicks up a concert on the rooftop in 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 london yeah for the people down like that's it's incredible it's like a fairy tale type of stuff like it's Mm -hmm. it's amazing it's like a movie ending and um i don't know it, it between get back which you get the fully fleshed you see everything you you see how everybody's interacting and then when you see it cut down in let it be and giving off more of the frustration and 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 giving focus to more of the arguments and paul looks more controlling and like no i want you to do it this way you should do it this way and then you should do it this way and then you should do it this way and like it it changes i feel like how you feel about paul mccartney if you just watch the smaller version um but it's beautifully remastered uh uh, again um peter jackson did all the remastering on it uh it has an intro with peter jackson and uh lindsey uh sorry michael lindsey hogg um and uh also this movie is an oscar winner it won uh it won for best original song score so the beatles won an oscar uh they did not attend the oscars though and quincy jones collected the award for them they were too cool for the oscars Come on, guys. Yep. Bunch of squares. Um, <laughs> but this movie rocks. Uh, but I'm a I'm a Beatles guy. I mean, my second daughter Hannah's middle name is Lennon, so you know, it's yeah. they're obviously important and uh just an incredible film. I don't know if you watched Get Back or have any interest in this one or concert films in general. I don't recall ever watching a concert film, quite honestly. No. no. Um I mean, the subject interests me, but I don't know if I could sit down and mm. watch like a full length movie about yeah. it. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah. Maybe one day. One of these days. Yeah, maybe. Because we yeah. uh, there is a second one coming out this month uh, on Disney Plus, uh, Queen Rock Montreal, uh, which comes, okay. it's about two weeks. And I think we'll probably be getting screeners for that one. So. I'm looking forward to that one, and I like that we're getting these remastered and and kind of 4K revamped uh, music things because I'm a big music nerd as well. So it's cool to see these things, especially classic stuff. All righty, let's move on to Sugar. Private investigator John Sugar examines the mysterious disappearance of Olivia Siegel, the granddaughter of a legendary Hollywood producer, starring Colin Farrell, Kirby, and Amy Ryan, 
and it's created by Mark Protosevich, available on Apple TV+. So how do you feel about Colin Farrell? Do you like him? Is he charming enough? I love enough? Colin Farrell. And you'll love, love this show. I love, love, Colin Farrell. You'll love this show then. This is so, okay. he's charming. He's a PI, right? Mm-hmm. So he has that suave quality. But then at the end of episode one, things go hallucinating and you don't know what's real anymore. And it that's your draw into watching the rest of the series. Because this it is sounds like, like something Colin Farrell would be in. For sure, things, for if, sure. If things get all crazy and trippy, yeah, Colin Farrell's in. Yeah, it. but like <laughs> leading up to that, he's a PI looking for a missing girl. You know what I mean? I, mm-hmm. I'm looking for this missing woman. Let's let's shake the street and see what pops up, type thing. That's yeah. what this is. Amy Ryan plays another like another great. She's just a brilliant character actress. I I absolutely love her. Um, she's uh you I know you've seen her before. Did you watch The Office? Yeah, obviously. It's, it's who uh it's who Michael ends up with. Holly? It's Holly. It's Holly. Yeah. I Amy really, Ryan is really Holly. like her. She's amazing okay. in everything she's in. I mean, Gone yeah. Baby Gone. Like she's so good mm-hmm. in everything she's in. And just the chops that she brings to everything. She really exhibits that in Sugar. It's a show that um didn't really have a lot of fanfare coming up but as soon as it debuted on an Apple TV plus people really started watching it and just based on the fact that Colin Farrell's name's on it and he's also a producer on it um and it yeah like i said it's really predicated on his charm but um i i really dig it and also uh Nate Cordry is in this and i had the privilege of podcasting twice with Nate Cordry when we were part of the, when i was doing the League of Man Children podcasts so it, when every time I see him show up on something, I'm like, yeah, yeah, buddy, way to go. <laughs> um, and Farrell has to be busy because uh, I don't know if this is going to uh, get a second season or if it's just a standalone series. But he also has The Penguin, which is coming out this year, which oh, okay. has him under insanely crazy makeup. Like You saw the Batman, right? The Robert Pattinson Batman. I tried. It's good. You need to you need to try it again. It's good. Okay. And you need to get to Colin Farrell. He's the penguin. And have you seen a picture of him as the penguin? Yes. That's Colin Farrell? Like it's yeah. I mean Yeah, it's it's crazy. Is the makeup so great? So for him to do a full se- season, a full series as this as the main character. I just hook it to my veins. I'm so down. And I'm so excited for the next uh, Matt Reeves Batman. Because I, I, I think he is he is such a killer director that um, I always look forward to what he does. Um, but yeah, I think you, uh, if given that Colin Farrell love, I think you'll like, uh, you'll like Sugar. Okay. All right, let's move on to, oh boy. Now this is a lot of fun. Conan O'Brien must go. Follows Conan O'Brien as he visits new friends he made through his podcast, Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend 2018, and engages, engages, wow, and engages in in depth discussions with viewers from all around the nation and the globe, starring Conan O'Brien and is available on Crave. Oh boy. So for me, Conan is my favorite late night host ever. I think Craig Ferguson would be second. Um, but Conan is number one, always will be number one. He is to me, one of the funniest men on the planet. And I love the fact that if he finds something funny, he will not relent. He will. And this show illustrates that point so many times. So basically like the, like that synopsis says, he's, he's caught, he's been made contact with fans through his podcast and um just feeling like innocuous thing like they have a conversation for about 20 minutes and then they say their goodbyes so this show is predicated on conan just showing up on some of these people's doorsteps and be like hey i'm here what's going on (laughs) and so episode one is norway and okay he shows up on the doorstep of this um he's like a, a norwegian um edm rapper okay and it's insanely funny and it's also a lot of like man on the street stuff like he'll come across somebody and be like hey uh, can we just talk for a bit and um he has a conversation with one guy uh one norwegian about personal space 
and as he's having the conversation he's moving closer <laughs> to the guy it's i mean i adore this show so much i know he uh, some maybe some of his comedy is a little juvenile or rubs people the wrong way but I just I think he's just absolutely delightful. The show was uh, released on his 60th. The, the first episode was released on his 60th birthday, uh, April 18th, and uh, which I, I thought was kind of funny. And um, he's leaning into stuff that I thought he did really good with his um, with his TBS series when he did the Conan Without Borders, which I thought was really, really funny. Where He would spend like a week in in a city in, in some part of the world and do a show from there. Um, and there's beginning narration this in this series from Werner Herzog that I thought was also really, really, really funny. And uh, yeah, I, I keep making this show, like, cause, cause especially because we don't have a Conan talk show right now. So let's keep making this one. This, this show's great. I love every second of it. I don't know how you feel about Conan O'Brien. I kind of stepped on that. I don't really have an opinion. Um yeah, I I don't have. You don't really have a late um, night talk show bone. Yeah, I, in the race. I I don't I don't watch late night talk You're shows. Not like, I don't even watch I like SNL. Jimmy Fallon. So. Was that? I don't even watch SNL. So. Yeah, I don't really watch SNL either, unless there's like I will go back and watch sketches, like if I've heard about them or if they they go viral. Like I watched a lot of the ones from the Ryan Gosling episode recently, especially that Beavis and Butthead sketch. I, I don't know if you've seen this thing, but it's hilarious. I just pantomimed the entire Saturday Night Live sketch for you. That's so embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> but at the end of the day, guess what's good? Conan O'Brien must go. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, let's move on to the final one of this week uh, for the streaming pile. Dead Boy Detectives. Charles Rowland and Edwin Payne decided not to enter the afterlife to stay on Earth and investigate crimes that involve supernatural stuff. Starring George Rextrew, Jaden Reverie, and Cassius Nelson. Created by Steve Yockey, based on the characters created for DC by Neil Gaiman and Matt Wagner. And it's available on Netflix. I looked at the trailer for this. Um... This this is for a very specific person, I feel. I think it is, but also I really like Neil Gaiman. Like I really like his writing. I like his character building. I, and especially when it makes the leap to TV. I think those characters translate well. Good Omens is a really good series. And it's because there are such well-written and established characters in, in the hands of really good actors. So the, un the good thing with Good Omens is you have Michael Sheen and you have David Tennant, two actors that are just, you put anything in their hand and they're going to make art, like honestly. Mm -hmm. But the difference with Dead Boy Detectives is all three, none of these actors are established at all. Like this is their point to make their name. And what it feels like to me is like a doom patrol cross with like skins, like um, the, okay. the ITV or the channel four series skins, not so not as sexy and steamy as skins was, but like the dialogue, just the way the dialogue flows reminds me a lot of that um and which is interesting because technically this was supposed to be a spinoff of doom patrol because both the dead boy detectives and a character named the night nurse already debuted in that series but then when max decided to amalgamate a bunch of shows netflix ended up catching dead boy detectives and kind of changing it because they already have the Sandman as well. So they're just like, okay, mm -hmm. we'll just make it another Neil Gaiman show. And we'll kind of take away that connection to doom patrol, which is kind of sad to me. Cause I adore doom patrol. I'm coming to the end of my viewing of watching it. Cause I just got season four on, uh, on Blu-ray. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I really like this show. Um, uh, both uh, George Rextrew and uh, Jaden Reverie are, are really, really great in it, but it, all comes together when Cassius Nelson joins the uh, the episode in episode one as uh, Crystal Palace. 
I really she's she's like the human conduit of the story because nobody can see either either of these guys, but they can see her. But because she is this all powerful psychic, and I I don't know it's, it's really solid. It's it's well written, and like I said at the top, I'm such a sucker for Neil Gaiman written characters. Um, there is such a a goth quality that yeah. that just speaks to me i i mean i i am a i am a i am a, a dormant goth from the 90s um in a lot of ways in 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 a, in a lot of media that i still take in kind of reflects that as well so yeah th- like you said there's a very focused of, of who they want to check this the show out uh, there's a show that kind of reminds me of it a little bit though i think dead boy to text is better called um, Lockwood and Company, Lockwood and Co. That came out. I want to say six to eight months ago. Another ten episode series on Netflix, and one that they abruptly canceled for whatever reason. Um, but uh, I feel like there's like a grouping starting on on that that you can form on Netflix, and uh, those shows would fit really well together. Um, it, also, that was the other one um, they did like four seasons. Lock and Key. Those would all those right. shows would be really good to put together. So yeah, I if you were thinking of looking up, uh, checking out Dead Boy Detectives, I would recommend it. Okay. Yeah. Um, what like because like I sc- scrolled past like Lock and Key and Lockwood and and that, and I don't know like I think it might have been like the whimsicalness that was kind of putting me off for some reason. Mm-hmm. It's like but the Tim Burton quality. Like I'd say Dead Boy Detectives is a little bit more Tim Burton mm-hmm. in the way of like it's grungier, it's yes. darker. And the other ones were just kind of too like I don't know, fairy tale-ish for me, but this one is like more like dark and brooding and like yeah. that like I'm I'm more drawn towards that. They're swearing that that's okay. the difference right away they're swearing lockwood and company was done by joe cornish um which the last thing that joe cornish did was the kid who would be king um that was the last movie he did but joe cornish also came onto the scene with attack the block and that's why i jumped into lockwood because i'm a huge fan of attack the block i love that movie that's why when they announced that john boyega was gonna be in star wars i'm like hell yeah he's from he's from attack the block I, i'm so into this um but yeah i I can tell yeah it's it's a certain it's it's a certain filter almost that these all these shows kind of share i have to say goth is definitely part of that filter yeah it's got that quality to it and especially when you got neil gaiman involved it's super goth all right so let's go to our next segment everything that's new to my library this week uh and things that i'll be bringing to the show later but i just wanted to give you the goodness on what is actually contained in each of these discs that i was sent first up is eight men out uh this is a white chicago white Sox baseball uh movie that's not field of dreams uh but it does feature john cusack uh charlie sheen is in this one roughly around the time that he was doing uh major league uh and db sweeney who is a 90s and 80s staple for sure and it was uh directed by uh, john sales uh there's no future on the on the blu-ray uh but i've actually never seen this film so i'm actually kind of looking forward to checking it out especially being a 90s baseball fan like i was uh also we have all up in the biz uh which is a documentary on legendary hip-hop figure biz marquee who was also very much a yo gabba gabba uh staple <laughs> as well the 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 biz was always part of uh yo gabba gabba and i adore that show i Just... loved when jack black came on yo gabba gabba that was yes. that was peak peak yes. children's tv yes absolutely yeah absolutely yeah, yeah definitely like some that show is and so I was insane. like 13 at the time I know, right and you were still into it you were still into it okay well no hannah was watching it <laughs> <laughs> there's a party in my tummy so yummy, i still say so that yummy. <laughs> have your kids watched it no i i don't know where it is 
It's probably on um, Paramount Plus because it's, I believe it's Nickelodeon. Okay. Yeah. Fruit salad. Yummy, yummy. Uh, I don't this, know. They might be too old now. Yeah, maybe. They'll be like, why are you putting this on? We watch horror movies now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but this one's on DVD only. Um, I was trying to find information about this documentary and it doesn't exist. I, I requested it from the good people at Allied Vaughn and moviezing.com. But I can't find any information about it on the internet at all. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I got a unicorn or something, but I'm glad bec- that I got it because I love the Bismarcky. Um, as far as um, she's just, uh, she's just a friend. That's, that's his, his big track. If you look Mm -hmm. them up and uh, classic stuff. Uh, I also got Strange Way of Life. Uh, This is a rare one for me because this is a short film. Uh, It's got uh, it's got Pedro Pascal and Ethan Hawke. And it's directed by uh, Pedro Almodovar. It is about uh, the the love affair between two gay cowboys played by Hawk yes. and, and, and Pascal. <laughs> uh, it is only a half hour long. I think it's one of my only short films that I have, like that it's exclusively like I have that, that DVD's main focus is a short film. I think the only thing else that would be considered a short, and I don't think it is, is Dr. Horrible sing along blog. I think that's a feature length though. I'm not too sure. I don't think that's considered a short film. So this might be my only like focused short film. Of course, no features, but why do you need features when you got Ethan and Pedro and Almodovar all in one place for half an hour? Like, and they're boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> the, okay, Pascal. Pascal is the rise, like for sure. He is the rise. He's he's worked hard at it for a long time. He was even in an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Like he's been do- paying his dues for a long time, and he's enjoying his rise right now. Ethan Mm Hawke has been around for a long time, done a lot of work, had many different periods in his career, but he is in definitely in a renaissance of his career right now. Right. Like he is definitely more celebrated than he's ever been celebrated before. I think as like an A-list actor, I I believe. Well, I remember for a while he was kind of like the butt of the joke, Mm -hmm. you know, but what what's he going to be in if he's coming back? Or do people like, or has just public opinion changed? Um, I he did a, a, a first part of like a really big awards push. Well, like Boyhood definitely was something that started getting him more and more recognized. Uh, but that was a mm-hmm. film that he'd already done with a guy that he'd done a lot of work with. He because he did that with Richard Linklater, so he did the whole before trilogy with him, uh, before before sunrise, before sunset, and before midnight. Um, which are all very celebrated in the, the indie world. And then he did a movie. Um, he did a, a movie where he played a priest called First Reformed. It was directed by Paul Schrader. And that's when awards buzz started coming around. And they were like, Ethan Hawke, best actor. Ethan Hawke, best actor. And it never materialized as far as Oscars went. They never made it that far. Okay. But nobody forgot. And then all of his choices became really interested and really focused and we started paying attention and he was already in the horror game because sinister yeah, is a I, yeah, really yeah, good movie I, I was just gonna say the first sinister was really really good and then he's in the first purge yeah um he, well he's not, really not good the movie the horror. first purge but the purge no, the, <laughs> the first like well not not even well real life chronological purge that one yes because there is a movie called The First Purge. <laughs> so yes. I'm like, that's not that one. That's not that one. He wasn't in that one. He was in a movie called The Purge, which was The First Purge, but not The First Purge. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> um, but even though he wears a mask the whole movie, the black phone has a really yeah, good performance yeah, from yeah. him as well. I love that movie a lot mm-hmm. and i feel like people stopped talking about it really quickly i feel like it was one of the best thrillers that year like not really horror but thriller like yeah. really really good thriller um and great ca- kid actors which is like always a problem when it comes to it, it usually can become a problem yeah i don't know like lately a lot of the kid actors that i've been seeing at least have been pretty good yeah, like I think the bar's kind of been raised 
for child acting. So like, you know, they don't just let any any kid that looks the part. Mm-hmm. Come Wait in till you see Abigail. Yeah. Abigail's a really good game changer. All right. And uh, last one for this week is Joe Pickett complete series. Uh, this one stars Aussie actor uh, Michael Dornan, uh, who starred in The Invisible Man, uh, Goldstone, which is an Aussie film that I really, really, really loved. And I can actually be in the next few weeks be talking about the prequel to that film because uh, I just picked it up on Blu ray. Um, and he was also in Daybreakers, which is an Aussie vampire film with Ethan Hawke that I really, really did. <laughs> Uh, it all comes back together. And I mean, and the Invisible Man movie I'm talking about is the the one with Elizabeth Moss. And that movie rocks. I don't know if you saw the that movie, but it's so damn good. Really, really like that one. Um, and uh, just before we go away, I got one more segment. This week's reminder is that Taste of Things is available on Blu-ray. Uh, I reviewed this episode, uh, this movie on episode, uh, the February 24th episode, and I gave it a four and a, four out of five because I really, really liked it. It'll make you really hungry, and it's beautifully shot. Juliette Binoche and her ex-husband uh, cook all the food in this this movie and it's uh it's it's a rare breed of of chef movies and uh they should have more of them because uh why the hell not it, it could make a whole a whole food drama section food drama food comedy throw them all in there i'm I'm totally down i think all right. the only like food like food centric movie that i've seen is fried green tomatoes and i watched it in high school like in school Aww, nice and what did you think of it it was it was i mean i was kind of bored but i mean <laughs> i was able to like absorb the film and i was like yeah mm-hmm. okay like i i can see why this is like such like a an acclaimed film you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but Kathy again Bates it's is just really like, good Kathy yeah Bates really i i good love Kat- kathy oh. bates yeah she's great and Listen, Meryl Streep in it as well. No, it's Mary Louise Parker, and ah, Mary okay. Louise Parker went on to be like years later, like over a decade later, she was on that. She was the lead on a show called Weeds for like right. eight or nine seasons, which is actually an okay show for the first four seasons, I'll say, and then it kind of falls off a cliff. Anything <laughs> that that creator makes, because that creator also made Orange Is the New Black, there's a shelf life. Oh, as soon as you get to a yeah, certain there point, definitely is. It goes boo. I I just again let's bring him back to your walking dead your fear of the walking dead critique characters and either being so solid in who they are or it's too loosey goosey. And if you go yeah. either way, there's there's a fine line. You have to hug that line, especially when you're doing a show that's over four seasons. Over three yeah, seasons. For sure. You know, they, you, you need to have strength of character to have a mm-hmm. long running series. Yeah, it's it's the unfortunate truth of it, because otherwise you are going to start to see the holes in the the holes in the tapestry, you know? Yeah, for sure. All right. So let's move to. <music> which is going to be Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. I uh, know Matt Reeves directing this one. It's Wes Ball directing this one. And uh, I can't say I'm a huge, huge fan of, of Mr. Ball's work. Um, the The Maze Runner I liked. Uh, mm-hmm. The next movies in that series, I hated every single one to follow after that. Scorch Trial, I, was... I really died, didn't like. Death Cure, I did not like at all. Um, and I kind of spacing on what else Wes Ball did. but. Um, really just that maze runner movie i thought that was solid and then i don't know what happened but the reviews so far are good for this one so i don't know i loved the maze runner movies because i was i was a teenager Mm -hmm. and i had a huge crush on dylan o'brien but i think every teenage girl that existed did and i think people still do because he's actually like seems to be like a good dude as well yeah like that's like that's the staying power. Like, oh, you're actually like a nice human being. Oh, well, shit. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Like, 
I could be into that. You're not Ansel Elgort or something. You know? What do you do? Uh, apparently, he's a dick. I don't know. Maybe I'm talking, telling lies out of school. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think I, I heard know. that he's a dick. We might have to look that I one up. I could believe that, though. We could, yeah. He's got that air, that quality to him. But he's on a really good show called Tokyo Vice, so I don't know. But the, I actually heard a really interesting story uh, before we go about the Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, uh, that the actors, the ape actors, when they see each other in public now, because they went through ape school and then made these movies, they don't <laughs> they don't greet each other as human. They greet each other as as apes now. So like, like the like this it's, le- it's like learned behavior. They put their heads together. They 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 get excited. You know what I mean? Like all that's like it's just ingrained in them from months of working together doing this. So it's like a it's like a muscle memory thing. Why is this making me want to go through ape school? I want to go through ape school. I that sounds like a get... dope community to be to be a part of. Like I know, like I want. I hopefully through this we can share it enough through twentieth through Fox that they'll see this and they'll be like, let's put those two, that that father and daughter through ape school. Let's do it, Chloe. <laughs> let's go to ape school. Let's get it. Yeah. Let's get a sponsored by ape school. Yeah, come on. Return to monkey. Everybody. Everybody. We're just gonna become a cult, Everybody. actually. Monkey yeah, cult. let's do that. Let's make a commune where we just act as apes. Yeah. It'll be up here in, in uh, the Okanagan. Yeah. There we go. There we go. You're already in. I, I love it. I love it. <laughs> but that brings to the end this episode. Did you have anything to bring this week? Uh, no. I've okay. been watching children's programs all week. Okay. That's fair. We don't need that. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but that brings to end this week's episode of What the Hell Should I Watch? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, Letterboxd, at The Steve Dead. You can find me on Letterboxd at Honey Bun Chloe. And you can find uh, this episode at stevestebbing.ca. Of course, you might already be on the YouTube page already. And if you haven't, please like the video and give a subscribe if you haven't done that either. Uh, you can find the show also on shiftheads.ca. Thanks to my friend Shane Hewitt. And uh, that is it this week. Our list is empty of everything that we're watching. So we got to go fill it up. So until then, have a good one. <laughs>